So when we chant like this, when we when we sing like this, we're turning ourselves to a deeper place within us. And they say that every repetition of one of these names, what they call these revealed names, as opposed to, like, for instance, here in America, if you live in Texas, you might get a truck. You might name it Bob. So that's not a revealed name. I had a truck named Bob actually once. <laughs> An old white pickup. Anyway, um, these are called revealed names because some great saint, some truly great being, <clears throat> realized the truth of things. Actually realized. Right? And through the repetition of one of these names, or through the realization, he recognized one of these names as being a representative of the deepest place within. And so he spoke that name, or she spoke that name, in this world, which is why it's called revealed. It came from within, and so it has the power to bring us back to ourselves. If we repeat, Frank, Shri Frank, J Frank, J Frank, J J Frank, <laughs> or Hari Frank, Hari Frank, 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 Hari Hari, you get a headache. <laughs> and everybody named Frank in the universe will be knocking on your door. So, see, the real meaning of these names is not something intellectual, it's some, something you can read in books. The real meaning of these names is actually who we are. It's very unusual because we're born in a world where um, nothing is what it seems. Well, let's not start there. That's too complicated. Even I don't understand what I'm talking about. Um, anyway, so through the repetition of these names, we turn towards that place within us where from these names originally came. That's what they say. And. Um, <clears throat> the, the funny thing about these practices is that what happens over time is you spend less and less time in heavier negative states of mind. You don't notice because the noticer is heavy and negative and that's who's not there during those periods. So you don't get to do a big trip on it while wow, I'm I must be getting really high. I haven't felt depressed for three minutes. <laughs> Doesn't work like that. You just stop spending, you just don't realize it. But over time, if you look back, you'll notice that you, you don't spend, you ha you're not spending as much time in these heavier, darker, unhappy states of mind. And it's, that's how these practices work. For instance, I actually mope around less than I used to. It's a goddamn miracle. I'm a moper. I moped my whole life. And now I hardly get a chance to mope anymore. I actually miss it. Sometimes when I feel a little spaced out, I'll just mope around the house just for fun. It feels so good so familiar, you know. So that's what happens is you just, those states don't arise. We think we're in control of everything. We're the boss of our lives. Come on. Ah, not even close. We're just at the, vic we're at the mercy. We're victims of every stupid state of mind that arises and we have no vote about it. And we think we're running the show. It's ridiculous. So how we do get a vote is by doing the, through these practices and opening up to the Dharma, to, uh, to this spiritual path. We start 
cultivating different qualities in ourselves. For instance, one time uh, in New York, I was going to sing uh, this song that I wrote, uh, My Foolish Heart, right, in English. So I said to the audience, I say, okay, I'm going to sing something in English now. So later on, a friend of mine who was in the audience said, you know, when you said that, the guy next to me said, oh, I didn't come here for this. <laughs> Isn't that fantastic? What did that guy come here for? That's what I want to know. So What? Pure Sanskrit, yeah, because you could be stupid and be totally pure in Sanskrit for the rest of your life. No, this, and so the issue is this. That guy didn't want to hear anything in English. Why? Because English, for most of us, is the language that we give ourselves a hard time in. English is the language that we tell ourselves the stories about ourselves that we don't like. English. That's, where, that's how we kill ourselves, with English. So we think if we can chant something that we don't understand, that's better. <laughs> not necessarily. Not necessarily not, but not necessarily so. So I began to think about that. And what, you know, for instance, in many, in most spiritual uh, traditions, like in, they, they, have, they ask you to cultivate what they call sattvic qualities. You know, I have to be honest with you. I hated that shit. I hated it. I didn't want to hear about sattvic anything. You know, because I just, it's just, you know, pure my ass. I don't want to, I don't care about that stuff. However, as it turns out, <laughs> they're actually right, you know. <sighs> and what it's about is finding a way to go through the day in a new way without moping around, without putting yourself down, without judging this one or that one or yourself, or going on and on and on with judgmental mind, evaluating and, and judging and, and liking and disliking and all that stuff that we do 24-7. We have to find something to do. We have to cultivate happy thoughts, keep thinking happy thoughts. If I, you know, I hate that, you know, I, I can't stand that. But unfortunately, once again, it's true. Because <laughs> if you're not happy, what are you? Unhappy. Okay, next, you know. If you're not awake, what are you? Asleep. So, so they talk about cultivating compassion and kindness, loving kindness, equanimity, and joy, spontaneous joy. Joy that just arises by itself for no reason. They, well, actually, there are reasons, but they talk about, qual about cultivating those qualities because if we don't cultivate those qualities, our natural, or actually our unnatural flow will just continue the way it's always continued, bouncing off one reaction after the other all day long till we fall asleep and wake up in the morning and do it again. So all that Mickey Mouse stuff that I hated so much turns out to be true. What do you know? So, because you're, you, you, you can't stop thinking. If you think that you're going to sit down and meditate, and if you try really hard, you're going to be able to stop thinking, get over it. That is not going to happen. Thoughts will keep coming and coming and coming. What changes is the way we meet and greet those thoughts as they pass through our awareness. That's what changes. You know, in the old days with Maharaji, he, uh, I've told this story a million times, but there were the Kirtanwalas from Vrindavan that was singing Hare Krishna, and they got kicked out of the temple because one of them tried to seduce one of the Western women. So Maharaji kicked them all out. And one of the Indian people said, Baba, who's going to sing now? The Westerners. Oh, terrible. Because he had to sit around in this little room around the corner. You couldn't see him when he came out. And all day long, he had to sing, Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, 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 all day long. It was horrible. You have no idea. Because we had one instruction. 
sing. Nothing about stopping. It was like eternal damnation. There was no end to it. When is, how is it going to stop, you know? And then it, he would say, okay, the bus has come, now go. So you had to leave then, and you couldn't see him. It was horrible. But because we had, he forced us to sing, something after, like, I don't know, some long period of time, like a couple of weeks, hi, bye, Nina, bye, Uma. Bye, Nina. See you later. Box out. So um, eventually something happened, and it was completely unexpected. I mean, you, you're spiritual people. You came here because you understand there's a spiritual path. Is that a big cricket farting? What is that? Anyway. Bye, Rigmini. So... Um, something began to happen, and nobody was more surprised than me, because I never thought anything's supposed to happen. You sing, and then you go to sleep, big deal. But it turned out, what happened was, I had to keep singing Hare Krishna. No matter what I was thinking, or no matter what I was feeling, I had to keep singing. And over like a period of like five or six hours a day for a couple of weeks, there was a complete figure ground reversal. That's somebody's phone or something, right? Kev, what is that? Huh? Oh, they don't have to stop. I just wondered what it was. Okay, don't tell me. All right, so, uh, so what happened was the thoughts would come, but the mantra had become like home. It was extraordinary feeling. It wasn't any longer anything I was doing. Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Krishna Krishna. It was going on. I mean, it was coming out of my mouth, but at the same time, it was like the whole feeling had changed, and the mantra became like a f started to feel like home, and the thoughts were not home. They just would go through like this, and I would just go. You know, I would watch them go through. And I wasn't thinking, although the thoughts were coming. It was completely unexpected. And only because he forced me to sit there and go through all my shit, all my moods and boredom and anger and guilt and shame, all this stuff, because I was reliving my life. You know, Hare Krishna, oh yeah, I remember what I did. Oh yeah, oh, yeah I remember what I did. That was great. Oh, yeah. On and on, day after day. After a while, the mind just kind of like, Psst, you know, but you have to face all that stuff and go through it. And you can do that with the mantra, with these names. And what you find is yourself. It's so weird. Who would have thought that? Right? You th we think we're ourselves now. Ha! Huh. It isn't, we're not. We think we are. We think we are our thoughts. Our thoughts are thinking we are, but it isn't. Those are just thoughts. There's, there's underneath all those thoughts, it's like the sky with clouds going through it. The sky is not affected by the clouds. It's always clear blue sky. The clouds pass through, but they don't change the sky. They may change the way it looks, but the sky stays the same, or the space stays the same. And what happens is you drop slowly into that space, and then your stuff just keeps going without you, and it's great. You're no longer required to be busy being yourself all the time. It's a big job to be yourself. You gotta remember who you like, who you don't like, what you eat, where the bathroom is, don't laugh. I'm in so many hotel rooms, I once pissed in the closet. <laughs> True. So, anyway, questions or anything?
but it's through making an effort. You have to make an effort. Maharaji said an unusual thing to us. One time he looked at the Westerners and he said, I've done everything. I've, I've done everything for you. I just leave the mind to you. Thanks. <laughs> but that's our job, is to clean up our rooms. That's what we have to do with our lives. And if we do that, everything else will take care of itself. Somebody, oh, okay, back there. You, are you picking or am I picking? You want the tips or I to get the tips? What do you want? <laughs> right here, second row. Raise your hand so I can see. Yeah. Hi. Hi. Um, I guess my question is in reference to the rejection of the mantra. The what? The rejection, when you reject a mantra, uh, when the mind, mm -hmm. You want to repeat the mantra. Mm -hmm. um, you have the desire to get deeper and with the mantra, mm -hmm. but the mind rejects. There is this subtle rejection. Um, how can you go through that? How can you? I know you. You might say keep repeating the mantra. Mm -hmm. That's perhaps the right answer. But I would like to see. You know, what do you think about that? How is it that? Well, it it's all beyond the rejection. Yeah, I wouldn't use the word rejection. It feels like that to you. You're just not paying attention, really. You just forget. Um, I see. Re I mean, I'm. I mean, rejection in a way that I want to keep doing it, but there's something yeah. that keeps yeah, well, pulling you, me you, away from it. Yeah. You. Well, you're used to going in a certain direction, and right. and now you're you're introducing something else. It's not easy. It's not easy. But you shouldn't try too hard. I mean, the whole essence of this is to relax when you meditate. You shouldn't be tense. If you're tense, forget about it. Nothing's ever going to happen except you get cramps. You know? well, yeah. what's, what's interesting is that I want to do it, mm -hmm. and it feels good. Yeah. And I want to stay mm -hmm. in that state. Right. But there, the mind comes in with, mm -hmm. with, with the thoughts. Isn't, and it's, isn't that interesting? It's, yeah, it's like... Yeah. Why are you coming? Why are you leave me alone? I want to be at peace. Just notice it and come back. You have to just keep coming back. When, by the time you're actually noticing that you're gone, you're back. Otherwise, you would be just dreaming, right? You notice you're gone. You notice you're, you've lost remembering the mantra. You notice that. So that's when you're back. So at that moment, you just come back to it. You just remind yourself of it again. You can't use will to do this. You'll just get hemorrhoids. <laughs> you can't. It can't be done like this. It has to be done like this. And you can't speed it up. You can't make it go faster. You can only do the best you can, which is when you notice you're gone, rededicate yourself in that moment to the mantra for one second, and then you'll be gone again. Noticing it is a really big thing. Think of all the people who never notice in their lives. They get born, they go to school, they graduate, they drink beer, and they die. <laughs> and they never noticed they were here in the first place for one second. This is big time stuff. This is not kindergarten, this is, this is real life. So, notice when you, you, you would never notice unless you're paying attention. You would never notice you're gone, that you've forgotten unless you were paying attention, right? Right. So that's good. That's very, very good. Come back and do it again. If you have to do it 15 million times in five minutes, that's fantastic. Because most people don't do it once their whole lives. Not once. So don't do it like this. Just give yourself a break. Don't judge yourself. Don't say, oh, I'm no good at this. That's just another thought. Let it go. Come back again and again, again and again, in a relaxed manner, but with direction. You're moving in one direction, even though you're sitting still. You're moving within. But you don't have to think like that. 
Just notice that you're not paying attention. That's a very big thing. And then you are paying attention. But then you're not until you are again. You can't force yourself to wake up. But by, by aiming at these mantras, at these names, by remembering these names, you're planting seeds that will wake you up from within as time goes on more and more. You can't wake yourself. It's like trying to pick yourself up like this. You can't do it. But through cultivating this awareness, you're planting seeds that will keep bringing you back more often until you can actually be here all the time. But not like this. Thank when you. you notice that, let go. Relax the body. Take a breath, relax the body. And don't try to sit for too long. You know, you get antsy. You know, I'm going to sit for an hour every day. Yeah, for two days, and then you forget to sit. Then you forget for the next 20 years, you never sit. <laughs> yeah, it's better to sit for 10 or 15 minutes and turn the phone off. But it's fascinating because you have the desire. You have the desire. I have the desire, mm -hmm. and I sit. Yeah. And every day I sit. Mm -hmm. But along with this desire is also mm -hmm. the opposite of it. Absolutely. Like, yeah. I don't want to do this. Yeah. But I do it. Yeah. And I keep doing it. And I mm -hmm. keep doing it. And then I don't want to do this. I yeah. don't want to do this. So it's like I get tired of it. So when, when is that the day where I'm going to feel like, yes, I want to keep doing this? It's always. never going to happen. <laughs> <laughs> so relax. <laughs> you can make it happen. You already are it. You just have to remember where to look and how to look, which is what you're in the process of doing, reminding yourself where and how to look. You don't have to make it happen. That's just another thought. When is it going to happen? I, you know, just notice it, be kind to yourself, let go and come back again and again. That's all you have to do. Thank you. Thank you very much. Don't thank me. You've got to do it. <laughs> You're welcome. Um, I've been a, a meditator for 45 years. Oh, I'm and, sorry to hear that. And uh, still, <laughs> still thoughts come. Sure. In, in the quiet. Why wouldn't they come? You spent 15 million births making them. You right. think a couple of years you're going to stop thoughts? But um, what, what I have to say is, though, that um, you have to be free there has to be a certain level of freeness of distress before you can meditate because uh, there was a, a period in my life when I was uh, really hurt and I couldn't meditate. For two years I tried to meditate and I, I just could not do it. Mm -hmm. And then it, you know, once that distress kind of went away, then I was able to uh, yeah. say the mantra again. I understand what you're saying, but you're also pointing out a, uh, a very common mistake that we all make is that we're going to make something happen by meditating. If you had s just sat with all that distress and not tried to change it, you were here when that distress was happening, right? It wasn't happening to somebody else. You had the option to sit there with it, but for whatever reason, you didn't make take that option, probably because because your idea of meditation is to achieve something and try to feel one particular way. That is not meditation. That's taking drugs. That's like taking drugs. I want to feel good. I don't want to feel bad. I'm going to meditate and I'm going to feel good. That is not going to work in the long run. You, meditation is to be with what is happening and add one thing to it awareness. That's all. Don't try to change it. You've been meditating for 45 years. Maybe you have a little bit of concentration. That is not going to get you anywhere in the long run. There are so many stories about saints who... There's a story about a saint who uh, was sitting on the banks of a river with his disciple and he said he asked the disciple to make him a cup of, t of chai and then he went into samadhi and he was in, the, in Samadhi for 50 years. And when he came out of Samadhi, he said, where's the tea? <laughs> there was no river, there was no disciple, there was nothing. But he was exactly the same person. That is not meditation. 
not real meditation. That's concentration practice. You need just enough concentration to recognize that you're not paying attention. That's all. Any more than that is using your will to try to create something that's already here. You are here. You don't have to make yourself here. You're here. Meditation is to recognize that. And all these tools, all these names are your name. It's not somewhere else. It's not somebody else. It's you as you are right now. But we can't focus on that. It's, in, it's very difficult. We keep wanting to feel better and we think meditation is going to make, make us feel better. Well, maybe for a little bit. But when you really feel better is when you're not attached and reacting to all the stuff that arises inside of us, that stuff we don't want to see about ourselves. So just be. It ain't easy. But don't try to build castles in the sand. They, they, they get washed away. So sit with whatever it is. It's not easy. So. I can't do it. Uh, I have a question about, uh, you mentioned, you talked about noticing, and, and uh, I have a question about noticing when you're doing things out of love or your heart or from your ego. And I would imagine in your um, life that the ego must be screaming very loudly and saying, you know, milk, milk the fame, milk the adoration, milk the, the public. What, what do you do when you notice that your ego is dominant and, and you're doing things for that reason rather than from your heart? It's more like, when isn't it that way? <laughs> You know, one time I was at uh, one of Maharaji's really great devotees named Dada Mukherjee. And uh, I was reverencing him a little bit too much for his own comfort, right? So he turned to me and he said, Krishna Das, he said, maybe I'm a step or two ahead of you. Maybe you're a step or two ahead of somebody else. He said, but we're all on this shore. The other shore is where the enlightened beings live, right? We're all on the shore. So it's all ego here. It's all ego. Any effort you make, who's making the effort? Your ego's making the effort. But the effort of planting seeds that will wake you up is a good effort to make. Ego. You know, once I was in the jungle with this very old Baba, who was 163, actually, at the time. He's older now. He's about 185 now. And he, 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 was, he, he looked at me and he goes, Ah, you need to develop willpower. And I remember I looked up at him and I thought, Willpower? What do I need that for? And then he saw what I thought. So he showed me inside me what he was seeing. And I went, oh! And I saw that I was tripping myself up every step of the way. I was putting chains around my, my feet every step of the way. I wasn't going after the things I wanted in life. I wasn't living 100%. I was just wimping my way through. And I saw that I needed to go after the things I wanted, that there was no, there wasn't spiritual life here and regular life over here. If I wasn't going for it, nothing was going to happen anywhere. I wasn't going to get the things I wanted in my daily life, and I wasn't going to, my heart wasn't going to open up in, in a different kind of way either. Nothing was going to happen because I was crippling myself. So it's all ego over here. No big deal. What else could it be? What else could it be? But, what, uh, we don't even want to get into this, but what is the ego? Who knows? You want to talk? Yeah, get the mic. Um, I, I was talking to one of my teachers, and he said, if, you, if, you notice, if you're doing something which you, you're doing uh, from a dharmic point of view or from your heart, if you notice yourself milking it, or uh, doing it, stop what you're doing. And I'm hearing you saying no. 
In other words, do you milk, do you ever find yourself milking it? And if you do, what do you do? <laughs> yeah. That's all I do. <laughs> um, I don't give a shit. It's not my problem, it's my guru's problem. And I said to him, I'm singing to people in your name. This is your problem. Actually, the truth is that I did quit singing when I first started, after about nine months. And it's in, if you want to know more of the story, it's in the, the book I wrote, Chance of a Lifetime. I quit because I couldn't do it from the right place, right? So to, to make a long story very short, I quit. And I went to India, and I, I started talking to Maharaji, and I said, listen, I'm not singing until you fix this. I was unable to do it from the right place. I was unable. I was not able to do it. And I couldn't change that either. I couldn't fix it. And so I said to him, you fix it or I don't sing, and that's all there is to it. Good night. That was it. And he fixed it to make a long story short. So I was able to come back and really, really do this the way it should be done. It was all his grace. However, that still doesn't mean that we don't need to pay attention to what we do and try to do it the best we can. Just laugh at yourself. Why don't you try that instead of taking yourself so seriously? Ah, uh, I'm milking it again. Look at that. Yeah, maybe she'll sleep with me. I don't know. I look pretty good today. Just laugh. You know, you're doing it again. It's just, it's just natural. If you stop doing everything any time that you're doing it from the wrong place, don't wake up in the morning. Don't even wake up. Because all day long all we do is, is bullshit. But it's okay. That's what we're human beings. We're here to learn and to develop and train ourselves. So you add something to your life. You add some practice to your life, and over time, that changes you. And yes, you can think about it in a million different ways, and every tradition teaches it and shares it their own way. But don't expect so much from yourself, you know. We're, we're babies, you know. And we, just can, we should just try to do the best we can that's all we can ask, right? What more can you ask? We're doing the best we can already. It may not be too good. We'd like to do it better, but so what? It's still the best we can. But that can get deeper. And the way it gets deeper is through more practice and more understanding of what the path is really about. You know, one second, I just admit. I look back at my life and I see a lot of things I've done that I wish I hadn't. I hurt myself, I hurt my family, I hurt people near me, you know. I couldn't do anything different. I couldn't. I was doing the best I could, you know. I couldn't stop. I couldn't, I couldn't not do the things I did. I have to live with that. And it's good. It, it reminds me to do the best I can right now and be as real as I can be now. If I had tried to stop myself, I would have exploded in some other direction. It's not so easy to cut something off. So, you know, I probably wouldn't be here the way we are now if, if I had done anything different in my life. So, this is not that bad. What are you going to do? That's the best we could do. And as long as you... That's the one thing I don't want to feel when I take my last breath. Shit, I wish I had tried harder. I wish I had done, you know, I'm, I wish I had done the best I could do and I wish I had done it better. I don't want to have that regret. So I try to do everything as right now, you know, as fully as I can.
not to argue with your teacher, but that's just the way I look at it. Somebody? Yeah, I have a question. Um, yesterday or last evening you did a chant and it sounded exactly like jingle bells. Bolo Ram Bolo, and it, did, was that really, did that sound like, was that jingle bells? <laughs> didn't it, it drove me crazy. Mm-hmm. <laughs> I didn't like it. It doesn't sound like it was a very long drive. It was, <laughs> yeah, right, you're right. <laughs> But was it? Did it sound like? Was it? I mean, well, where does the? Because I know that. Chance, which song was it? Ram Bolo. Bolo Ram Bolo Ram. Mm. Mm-hmm. <laughs> <laughs> Remember that? Yeah. You've 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 found out my true nature is yeah, Santa Claus. Yeah. Well, I. I, did. <laughs> I I'm, I thought I hit it better than that. Damn. But what's interesting is that. It, none of it's, uh, the music, the, you know, the notes, the dots, the little, you know, you can't be paper trained and, and be a uh, harmonium player, right? You can't be, be a, uh, toilet trained, would you no, say? I, I, call, I call it paper trained. Like if you're a musician and you, you know, read notes. Yeah. Yeah, it's not there. Oh, uh, well, it isn't, it isn't. Oh. You know, the harmonium is kind of halfway between an Indian instrument and a Western instrument. The keyboard is just like a piano. Yeah. So you could read music if you knew how to, which one doesn't know how to very much. Very, I can read music, but I can't really play like and read. Right. Right. <laughs> yeah, weird stuff comes out, you know, like um, my big hit, Namah Shivaya. It turns out that that's the same chords to a song called Because the Night by Springsteen that he gave to Patti Smith. I didn't know that until somebody pointed it out to me. And one of the Hanuman Chalices is just like Twinkle Twinkle Little Star. (laughs) Twinkle Twinkle Little Star. So who cares? (laughs) Jingle bells to you too. I'd like to thank you for your... uh, Hold it up a little closer to you. Yeah, okay. All right, thanks. Hi. Not a musician, obviously. (laughs) Um, I'd like to thank you for your um, reference to Slipknot yesterday, Mm. um, because that's one of my kind of hot spots as a a teacher, and and it's really difficult, the darkness. It seems Mm -hmm. like they, um, you know broadcast and and obviously um, many people like them yeah um, but I guess over this last 24 hours I've seen my whole circle um, unveiled right of, of thought unveiled in front of my eyes with the, the judgment and the ego and mm-hmm. and the difficulty that I have personally with that kind of darkness mm-hmm. and um, and I just wondered if you had any um, reaction. Darkness? No. <laughs> reaction to. I haven't to, seen the light yet. You know, to <laughs> essentially passing them in the hallway, you know, of your producers after, your, uh, after you finished your album, if you even care. Or, no, uh, I don't care. Yeah. <laughs> no, it, with that, that story was really more about Rick, the producer. Mm-hmm. He just, he's, he's so extraordinary being. He can, what he does is he can bring out of you, what you want to sound like, regardless of what kind of music it is. He, he, can, he knows what you want to sound like, what you, and he can bring that out of you. That's, and he can do it for anybody. If he could do it for me, he could do it for anybody. So he's done everybody, Slipknot, Johnny Cash, every, everybody, Chili Peppers, you know, everybody. Yeah. So it was more about that. Uh, you know, um, remember last night when we stopped singing we heard? those people actually think they're having a good time isn't that extraordinary I remember what that felt like it was like boiling in oil but yet that's where they are they're doing the best they can that's what everybody's doing even people who it looks like aren't doing very well or doing very nice things you know like one time, you know, I wasn't a big fan of uh, George W. <laughs> and uh, 
I was watching the news one day, and uh, they were showing he it was live, and he was he had flown to Florida, and he was meeting with the first thirty or forty widows from the the war, the Iraq War, and. He walked into that room, and he broke down crying. How can you hate somebody like that? You can't. It was so moving. I, I, I want to hate him, but I can't. And then I think about him, and I see that his own actions have created so much suffering for so many people. And don't you know he's going to have to live through the, the karma of that himself? That doesn't make me happy. So people who are in so-called darkness, that's just our judgment of it. They're making their own karmas just like we are. So we have, hopefully, just a little bit more understanding of how things work. Maybe just enough to plant some seeds that will bring us what we really want and not plant the seeds that will just bring us more suffering. So that's all you can hope for. Nice. Thank you. And I wondered also if you might entertain a request uh, for this evening for the the 4 a.m. Hanuman Chalisa, uh, just planting a seed. Probably yeah. not. All right. <laughs> but thank you. I'll entertain it as long as I can. All right. You never know. Uh, it's time for commercials. So I just want to share uh, something, somebody that was written into the Guinness Book of Records three weeks ago. He decided to, to change the aura of negativity in the whole world and also inside the people. So he was doing it with only a few people, but this time he got the hundreds of hundreds of thousands of people in one place for the longest time in history singing the Hanuman Chalisa. So when was this? This was three weeks ago. The, his name is. Uh, Ganapati Gurudatta Sachidananda. He's an amazing musician, mm -hmm. and uh, uh, he has a lot of power in the south of India. Mm -hmm. And also, he built his extravagant. He built the, the tallest Hanuman in the world. Is in Trinidad. So you know you have to do Abhisheka, and you have to wash wash the whole murti, you know, once in a while. Yeah. So the only way he could do it, they could not put a ladder. Mm -hmm. So they have to use a helicopter. Share that. So, so Hanuman Chalisa is so important for all of us to chant. So what Nina did, I think, is remarkable. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Um, I'm not exactly sure how to phrase this, but... It's okay. I'm not exactly sure how to answer Good. <laughs> I just wondered if you would speak a little bit to the guru, because you have one, and I don't, and I find myself longing for that, but here I am sort of in America, like, schlubbing along, great teachers. So you think I'm not schlubbing along? <laughs> you think having a guru guarantees you'll never schlub? I schlub all the time. Understood, um, and? Guru, God, and self are the same. Guru is not a human being, it's not a body. It's not a personality. It's the light that lives in that body. And that being has recognized that fully. And that qualifies them to be a guru. Uh, the light doesn't die when the body dies. The light doesn't go away. So uh, you say you don't have a guru. But that's not true because everybody has a guru. Everybody, somebody is in, is in some lineage, is connected through whatever. This is all, you know, this is if you believe in reincarnation, which I don't know if I believe in it. I think it's reasonable. But if you don't believe in reincarnation, what's the sense of having a guru? 
guru is not somebody who teaches. A guru opens you up and changes you from the inside and shows you real love. And then you have to find that inside yourself. They open you up, they wake you up to some degree. So you can say you may not have met your guru or don't know who your guru is, uh, but that doesn't mean you don't have one. You wouldn't be doing any of this stuff if you don't, if you, if you haven't done it before. You know, this is not what normal people do. <laughs> so, don't do that to yourself. Hi. Hi. Speaking of gurus, could you talk about um, what you opened up within yourself that led you to find your teacher? Or the process in which yeah. that was? For me, depression was the impetus to looking for something. I was very depressed as a kid. At least by, by the time I was a teenager, I was very depressed, very unhappy very uh, inside. Outside everything looked good, but inside I was a mess. Couldn't connect with people, couldn't have, couldn't get what I wanted. I felt very, very, very uh, fragile and very uh, crippled emotionally. And so I started looking for stuff, you know. I don't know why I started looking for stuff, but I did. Why it even appealed to me. Whereas my other friends in high school weren't really interested in any of this stuff. So, but I was. So I just started looking for stuff. And then, um, you know, I, I, I heard about this guy Ram Das. And uh, so I went to meet him. And when I walked into the room where he was, without a word being spoken, I knew that whatever it was I was looking for was real. It was real. That was amazing. And that was actually the moment that I met Maharaji, that moment, because what I felt was him, was that presence. And uh, after a couple of years of hanging out with Ram Dass, I went to India to be with him, with Maharaji. So it was just my desire, my, my low tolerance for unhappiness, you know? And so, uh, it just felt wrong. <laughs> you know, I don't want to be like this. Why am I like this? And uh, somehow or other I knew that I was looking for a way out, you know? And why I knew or how I knew that there was a way out, that I have no idea. But if you're here, you're also looking for a way out, so to speak. Why would you be here? It's rainy and cold. And you got to do all these weird positions at all hours. So you're looking for something. That's why you're here. And that's, how we, that's where we really meet in that search for ourself. OK? More? No, I mean, you, the one, I, I don't know your name, but was that what you were asking about? Is that okay? All right. Uh. You gotta, just one thing, oh, I'm sorry. You gotta recognize that everyone here, you all believe that there really is something to find. Even if it's just like this much. Even if you think you're here to get the best butt in your local town, or, you know. But that's what you think. But there's part of you that knows there's something to find. And that's why, that's what's really working here. And wherever you go, that yearning to connect to a more deeper place will be with you because you're here and it's there with you. And so uh, that's not going to go away until you find what you're looking for. So, I, I, I have always been very intrigued by Maharaj Ji. So, he is uh, very different from any other um, 
guru in the sense You can he, say that again. <laughs> and again. He's very different, yeah. Means he didn't have, uh, like, uh, you know, the teachings, this, this you should do, or that, uh, nothing of that. So he's Come, uh, eat, go. <laughs> he fed us more, f more puris and potatoes than you could possibly eat in a million lifetimes. And he would say to the guy sitting next to him, he said, see, I'm eating through all those mouths. This was somebody you can't understand. It's just completely, you know. And yet, our experience of him was total, absolute love. You know, unbelievable. You couldn't believe it. Can you, if you just close your eyes and imagine what it's going to feel like when you walk into the room and it's there. That's what it felt like. And it still feels like that. And that's, that's what it will feel like when you touch that. When I go, for example, I met few pe people in, in India, they, everybody would say, oh, Maharaj is such a great soul. And uh, yet I was never able to really fathom what exactly he did, but everybody, uh, yeah. all had such great respect, so I was wondering. He, he didn't give teachings, he didn't write books, you know. He just threw fruit at you and laughed at you. you know? <laughs> and if he was in a room full of people, and you asked each person to, to sit to tell what happened, in that hour that you were all together with Maharaji, you would get, if there were 20 people, you would get 20 completely different stories. It was as if they were with someone else in another room on another planet. Because he, 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 he interacted with the heart of each being there. And he would say something to you, but the person over there would get the message, and you wouldn't know what he was talking about. Like he would yell at you for something, like, you're a thief, you're a miserable thief. And then the person over there realized, oh my God, you know, I did that. It was insane. And it was all the time, there was no, there was no, He wasn't, he, he wasn't putting on any airs. I mean, it was just the way it is. It's so extraordinary. So, um, there are some books about him which you can read that are very far out, wonderful stories. All they are is stories, because that's all anybody can tell. There's about four books I would recommend, and I think they're listed on my website. Uh, one of them is Miracle of Love, by Ram Das, which you can get from Amazon. And if you're interested, read it. It's mind-blowing. So. And there's somebody in the way back, too, after this. I wanted to say that um, I feel like you brought Kirtan to the main mainstream and made it cool. I brought it to the bathroom. <laughs> I bring it everywhere I go. <laughs> um, most people think, you know, at least for me, my f even my family thinks I'm weird or kind of out there. And <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> but um, so I want to, you know, thank yeah. you for doing that because I think a lot of people relate to you. So ha I was also curious, has Hollywood approached you or anyone from the celebrity scene? Ha and I apologize if it's on YouTube and I haven't seen it, but... Um, <laughs> Where, what's that? <laughs> like, have you worked with any celebrities or... Because I know the Hollywood uh, folks kind yeah, of gravitate every once towards in a while yoga. Somebody stops through, yeah, you know. Uh, Any fun stories? Well, you know, I'll just tell you one thing. You know, I when when all these like Madonna and Sting and all these people started coming around, and uh, I got interviewed by Rolling Stone, I think it was, I think it was, and they said, "Come on now, tell us, you know, what are these people really? Where, you know, aren't they just, you know, just pretending?" And I said, no, you don't understand. These people, like, you know, these really big stars, so to speak, they're the kings of the earth now. 
They can get anything they want, any time they want, and as much of it as they want, any time they want. And they've done that. And they know that it doesn't make you happy. The rest of us, we still think, if I just got a little bit more of that, I might be good. <laughs> but not them. They know, and that's called wisdom. So, and you know, these people are great, you know. They're, really, they're not who you think, the, who the press writes about. They're, most of them are really good people. Madonna used to go to all the hospitals, wherever she was singing, she'd sneak out of the hotel and go to the children's wards at the hospitals. It was never publicized, she didn't want it publicized. She can do it now, but she, all these people, you know, they're good people. Sting does amazing things, wonderful things. So, we should be so lucky to have the karmas to fulfill all our desires. Then we would know that that don't make you happy. But we don't have those karmas. We get just enough to think, well, if I just got a little bit more. But it, that's why we're stuck where we are. So wisdom is as you recognize that more doesn't mean more. More doesn't mean more happiness. It means more frustration in the long run. But it's not good or bad. It's just what happens. It's, it's a maturing of your heart that happens over time. Like, forgive me, but how many relationships do we have to have before we realize we're going to keep creating the same shit over and over again? It just happens, right? So if you don't work on yourself, nothing's going to change. It's not about getting more. If you change, if you work on yourself and, and clean the dust from your own heart so that what you see reflected is clearer and more real, then you'll be treating everybody differently, not just your partner or your partners to be. You won't demand that somebody make you happy because you know that happiness can't come from the outside. What a pressure it is to put on somebody, you know, that they have to make you happy. You know? You're not making me happy today. So and how great it would be if we didn't do that to our partners, right? But we do. And they do it to us. That's what they call relationships. Okay, there was somebody in the way back. Did, did we get there? Yeah, where's, our, where's, where's the mic? Okay, go ahead. I got the mic. <laughs> you got it? Then you got it, girl. Go. You said something the other night that um, in India, there's a whole generation of, of people who weren't brought up with um, the spiritual practices and kirtan and things like that. Yeah. And, you know, I look around this room and, and been doing this for, you know, 15 years or whatever, and it seems to me that there is a whole generation here mm -hmm. uh, who's very into yoga and kirtan <clears throat> and yeah. I see your, your grandson learning the tabla. I wonder if it's a... Do you feel that there's maybe a, a passing of the baton of a generation of... These are all, to these are all karmic waves. You know, I had a dream once. Uh, I had two dreams. One dream I had, um, I was sitting with Maharaji with the other Westerners and uh, he was explaining to the Indian people there he said, oh, these people come from chapter 8 in the Gita. <laughs> so I opened up the book in the morning. The chapter, it's the chapter on fallen yogis. <laughs> Hello. <laughs> yeah, that feels perfectly right. You know? And another dream I had, I was coming back down, you know, reincarnating, coming back down to earth. And I was heading right to India, and I made a left turn and wound up in New York. <laughs> How that happened, I have no idea. So... Yeah, you know, it, if, if you look at it that way, it's perfectly reasonable. We have good karmas to be born in a place where we can eat, sleep, and satisfy our desires without too much trouble. And we have better karmas that eating, sleeping, and satisfying desires doesn't make us happy. That's better karmas, because now we have to look for real happiness. If we were still struggling to eat, 
we don't have the time to look or the inclination at all. If we were running from bombs, we wouldn't have the time for this. This is good, good. This is our own good karmas coming to fruition. We are now in a position to get everything we want to a certain degree and probably enough of it if we're not too greedy and still to recognize that there's something deeper, something more to find. It's a, this is what people pray for. You don't sit in a little village in India and pray that you get born without money, without a house, without food. That's not what you pray for. You pray for, you, you pray for comfort and love and protection and the ability to satisfy your desires. People think that desires are bad. Why do, you, why do we think that? Oh, my mother. That's why we think that. And your mother's. Desires are not bad. They just don't really work in the long run. That's all. Everybody has desires. Whether you're going to use other people viciously to satisfy your own desires, that's just going to create more negativity for yourself. But using, but honoring your desires and living in a good way and getting the things you need in life, is there something wrong with that? I don't think so. I don't think so. Nobody I ever met, all Maharaji's devotees were, were householders. They all worked, they all had jobs, they had families, not all of them, but so many of them. Most of the people I met were householders. I didn't meet the sadhus and the, the babas in the jungle that he knew. Being a, being a sadhu is no guarantee, you know. If you spend your whole life meditating in a cave and, and have hidden desires from yourself, all those desires are going to create a rebirth for themselves where they can be satisfied. That's the way it works. So be honest with yourself about what's going on. Because only you know. Nobody can tell you. Only you know what you want and what you need. And if you don't honor that and try to push it away and crush it, <laughs> you're, you're hurting yourself. Why would you do that? Oh, my mother, right. I knew there was a reason. There's a beautiful story about uh, one time Maharaja was walking uh, in this town called Brindavan. And uh, it was the middle of the summer, it was very hot. And coming the other way was a sadhu, you know, a real jungle baba with the hair and the, you know, the ashes. And, and they saw each other and they, they hadn't seen each other for like 50 years or something like that. And they jumped up and down and they were dancing. They were so happy to see each other. And, oh, da, da, da. and so after some time, Maharaji said, okay, you know, I have to go now. It's great seeing you. Take it easy. And the, other, the, other, the Baba said, no, Baba, no, I, I want to go with you. I want to stay with you. And he said, oh, no, 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 no. You don't want to stay with me. You don't understand. I'm surrounded by worldly people all the time, householders. You, know, you, go, you, you don't want, you're a jungle. You go back to the jungle. And he's, no, Baba, I want to stay with you. I want to stay with you. And he tried to talk the guy out of it, but he couldn't. So he said, okay, let's go. So they started walking. And in those days, between Brindavan and Mathura, there was nothing except desert. And it's the middle of the day, in the middle of the summer. It's like 190 degrees. And they're walking to Mathura. And they're dying of thirst. And in the distance, there's a well. And they see the well, and they start running to the well. And as they get close, they see there's a woman there drawing water from the well. And Maharaji gets there first, and he puts his hands out like this. And, she, and he says, Ma, pani dalo. And the mother, the, the lady pours water in his hands and he starts drinking while she's pouring like this. And he finishes drinking and the other guy arrives and he takes his gourd pot, kamandalu, and he puts it out and she pours water. As she's pouring the water, Maharaji starts talking her up because he talked everybody up. Hey Ma, where are you from? Where's your village? What's your caste? What's going on? It turns out this woman was an untouchable which in India in those days was a very big thing. Maharaji didn't care, but this Baba 
heard that she's an untouchable while she's pouring water into his pot, and he flipped out. And he takes the pot and he throws it down. He breaks and he starts yelling and yelling at my RG, look what you've done, look what you, this was my only possession, I need this. And my RG's going like, what, what? What's happening, what's happening? I, oh, I thought you were a sadhu, I thought you were a sadhu. Oh, this is, what is all this attachment? I thought, and the guy goes, oh, right. Maharaji said, he washed my feet with his tears and went back to the mountains to finish his work. See, Maharaji was so soft-hearted. He knew what was going to happen to the guy. He didn't, he didn't want to do that. He tried to get him not to come with him because Maharaji knew everything, past, present, and future. He tried to save him from that pain, but he needed that. So he let him come, and then he had to go finish his work. Maharaji was beyond caste, beyond all that stuff. But this Baba was still stuck in a false idea of purity, and he had to go finish his work. That's the way he taught. He didn't give lectures. He just, around him, everything, it's like a moth in a flame, everything would get burnt. Anything you brought, any attachment, any stuff, you had, it didn't get burnt in a, in a harsh way. It was the love that you wanted forced you to let go of your stuff because it was the only way back into the love. He, he let you in the room, but your own shit pulled you out. And the only way to get back in there was to drop your stuff. And, and then you were right back in immediately. That's how he taught. I'd be sitting in front of him depressed and, and days had gone by, I hadn't got a banana. <laughs> Everybody around me was getting bananas and papayas and apples. And I'm not getting nothing and I'm sitting there like this. Somebody called my name and I turned, boom, I got hit in the heart with a banana. And I look at Maharaji's going like. <laughs> he knew everything. He just waited until I was like a big pimple ready to pop. And then he went boom with the banana and, I, you know, and I'm back. That's how he taught. It was horrible half the time. Half the time it was, just, it was like the greatest and the other half of the time it was the absolute worst. Because there you were sitting with all the love in the whole goddamn universe and you feel like shit and you can't do anything about it and you're burning in your own stuff and you, you're just helpless and then he looks at you and laughs and everything's okay. It's crazy. It's like, it sounds sick, doesn't it? <laughs> but it wasn't about power. It wasn't like he had power over you. You could walk away, you could leave. He, like I said, Jiao, go away was his mantra. He didn't need you there. But if you wanted to stay, you had, you were forced to let go of your stuff because you couldn't taste the love when you were stuck being you. Hare Rama. Anybody? We got? Hello. We? Okay, and then there's a guy over here. Hi, I'm over here. Okay. Good yes. afternoon. Good afternoon. Is it afternoon? It's always morning. I think, somewhere. I don't know, actually. That's it, afternoon. I recently was in a position where I was in a recording studio and I was chanting mantra and I did all these recordings. I spent a couple of hours. And when the playback came, it was shit. And it, there was something seriously missing. And I wanted to ask you if this is a place you've ever been where I was in that experience and how you overcame that if that was a part of your process as a recording artist. Oh, I'm a recording artist, huh? Okay, I'll sit up a little straighter. <laughs> um, uh, 
yes and no. You know, I mean, <clears throat> you're the one who says the shit. Somebody else might hear it and, and like it, like when I do it. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. Um, well, the, the art of recording is, is, it's an art. It's very specific. It, it, you can't be sitting there emoting your ass off and hoping that it's going to sound good. You have to know how to, how to get it right on tape so that it works 5,000 times when a person listens to it. It's a little bit different in the studio. So it's a balance of learning how to actually do it, you know, really do it the way you would always do it, and yet funnel it into this m microphone in the studio so it's an it's pretty much of an art it's not so it's not so easy and then on the other hand it, some uh, you could put a mic in a room and get a great recording you never know the only important thing is what you're experiencing when you're singing if you're doing it for some reason then you know get a job do something else but if you're doing it for for your own sake to save your own heart then that's then anything you do is okay um, people think that kirtan, being a kirtan well is like a, a career, you know? What are you talking about? Uh, when I started doing this shit, I didn't even charge for the first, like, ten years. You know? I, was, I had a job, and I did it whenever I was in New York. I'd go down to Jiva Mukti. But then I got invited to California. What was I going to do, walk? I'd, I'd be around Ohio by now. And I had to carry my instruments with me, forget about it, no way. So we had a charge for, so I could get a ticket, and then I had to stay somewhere and eat. And that was the beginning of, of, you know, of charging for it, but it wasn't about a career. People ask me all the time, I don't know what they're talking about. People think I know what I'm doing, too. They say, how can I do this? I say, how the fuck do I know? I don't know what I'm doing. I'm singing to save my ass, period. Anything else is something else. I have no idea what it is. It's not a career. Just because you don't know how to write a song, you do a couple of mantras and put it to a couple of chords and think you're a kirtanwala, good luck. It doesn't work like that. This is spiritual practice. If you're not doing this to save your ass, don't do it. And if you do do it, pay some attention so that it will work for you. And don't think you're going to do anything for anybody else. Forget about it. If you're not doing it for yourself, it's not going to do anything for anybody else. Even if they think it's nice. You have to, this has to be your practice. And if it's, if it's, and people say, you know, I want to share my kirtan with other people. I say, you do? Why? I don't want to. I'd rather stay home and sing, but this is what I have to do. Really? You want to share? I don't want to share. Who's screw sharing? <laughs> what, you think I'm a good person? I want to share? I don't want to share. I want to, I want to be in love. And if this gets me there, I will do it. If it doesn't get me there, I'll do something else. But so far, it's working OK. <laughs> Here, there's somebody here. Oh, you and then here. Hey, um, first of all, thanks for the book. You're welcome. Which it book was that, the Bible? No, <laughs> the one that you wrote. Oh, thank you. It helped me a lot. <laughs> Good. And I got a couple of uh, practical questions. Mm -hmm. It looks like this is being recorded, and I'm wondering if it's going to be available. I actually, us, I don't know who's recording it. Who's recording it? We are? We are? And what about that thing there, I call it camera? We don't know whose is that. Somebody from the Bahamas is stealing this. <laughs> oh, uh, yeah. Is this part of the ashram thing? Fess up now, dude. You know, I'm, I'm going to Are you from the, are you from the CIA? Uh, get famous. Yeah, me, me and John Perkins, we teamed up and we're taking okay. down countries. So. Right. Um, yeah, no, I don't know. It's kind of up to... I think the ashram... Uses some of the footage for something, you know. Yeah, it's up to Rukmini to scare people away from the place. Here. I just put it on YouTube if they ask me to. Yeah, okay, that's all right. We are recording this. The audio is getting recorded, and we will be putting it up on on my website. 
there are there are there are a lot of workshops up there now, and there'll be more and more. And you know, I'm 67 years old. I've been doing this steadily for 20 years. When people start touring, they're usually 18. <laughs> and by the time they're 40, they're retired and live in big fancy houses. <laughs> or they're working at the A&P, one of the two. <laughs> I'm 67, I've been doing this 20 years, I gotta take some time off. I gotta take, or I'm gonna be dead. So I have to take some time off and rest. And one of the ways that I can afford to do that is, we, is we're going to get all these workshops up and kirtans up online, and hopefully people will go to the site and pay a few rupees so I can stay home and rest, which would be very nice. So that's going to happen hopefully next year before I fall over. So, uh, so they'll be available. Up on, on, there are already things available. I think there's some podcasts up there. Too bad Nina left. She's the only one who knows what I do. <laughs> so I call her up in the morning. Where am I today? Yeah. Uh, one other question. Uh, I really enjoyed the version of Hare Krishna that you sang last night. Cool. Mm -hmm. And I'm wondering if that version appeared. You probably won't be able to answer this It's on question. Kirtanwala. It's on the last CD. Okay. And it's also on the very first CD. There's a, but it was done very differently. I didn't, it didn't, you know, I wanted to do it again. So it's done in a nice way on the new CD. Thank you. You're welcome. You're welcome. Yeah, you know, I'm running on fumes, and I've been running on fumes for a long time. And uh, when the fumes are gone and there's no gas in the tank, the car stops. So I'm trying to, trying to stop before the car has to stop and uh, recharge a bit and slow down. And it affects you, you know, the constant travel, which I love, it, it, there's a, there's a, it builds up, and and you 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 lose kind of a connection with a. I know that when I'm really well rested, it, it's juicier, if you could imagine. <laughs> it gets scary sometimes, but I curse less now, so it's better. I gotta start getting back into cursing more, so. <laughs> Only if I rest. You know. So I, I don't feel good about that because I think, you know, there's more, I think, I, I just feel it could be, I feel it, it loses something when I get really tired. But maybe not, I don't know. Maybe that's just my mind, see? What am I, all the shit I tell you I can't even do. <laughs> Evaluative mind. So where are we? It's 1.29. We have one minute left. There's a question over there. Hello, Krishna Das. Hey. Um, Just met you. Yes. Yeah. My name is Bodhi. Um, and My. I have been listening to you since I was a very, very young boy. And every time I get to hear any of your songs, it always brings me back to a very grounded and um, sacred place for me. And I got the courage recently to get my own harmonium and actually start singing Takes for courage. myself. Yeah, and good. I'm not a very good singer, but I'm trying, and I find that it's one of the most blissful states that I've been in in a long time. And wherever I am, if I can sing and play my harmonium, that it it's it's grounding, Great. and it's like listening to your songs. Good. I was just wondering if there's any resources for your your music because it's not exactly easy to mm. listen to a harmonium and learn it yourself. Yeah. And so I, I have something that's like called the Bhakti Breakfast Club. Yeah, sure, Daniel. You know, yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah, that's and, good. And it, it's really helpful, but... but he, was, it's a little complicated. He, he teaches it in an Indian kind of way. Yeah, but also I was just wondering if there's any, any written music for your songs. There around. is, yeah. There's a booklet somewhere. If you go to the website, I think you'll find it. Yeah? And of some, some of the, the chants, the first few CDs anyway. Okay, cool, yeah. And then we are... In, another thing we're doing... and. Uh, we're, we're videoing me playing the tune, some of the some of the chants. So there'll be like a camera over here, so people will be able to see what my hands are doing, what notes, how how I'm playing the tunes. I resisted doing that for a long time. You know, I mean, there are people who go around and teach people how to lead chanting. That's like trying to teach people how to fall in love. How do you do that? You know, it doesn't make sense to me. 
But since people like to sing their chants, I don't see what's wrong with showing them how I, how I play them and the, 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 the hand positions so you can, you know, you can watch it over and over and over and over and over and figure it out. Yeah. So we're working on that. That's something that will be up in, within a, maybe six months or a year. Very cool. Thank you. You're welcome. Yeah. I'm in no hurry, so if you want to hang out more, we can. I don't know. Are we allowed to? Do we get beaten or something if we stay? Oh, Kevin's got to go. Okay. I was wondering if you could read us a poem. If I could read you a poem? Us all. <laughs> huh? Where are you? Oh, this poem. Uh-oh. Four score and seven years ago. Oh, this poem. Ah, this is a beautiful poem. What, you want to see me cry? What's wrong with you? It's not bad enough. Uh. So this is called Love Dogs, and it's a poem by Rumi. And if you haven't read Rumi, you haven't read anything. There's no one like him in the universe. Well, this Hafiz is pretty good. <laughs> Kabir, pretty good. But Rumi is really something. So read Rumi if you can. Coleman Barks' translations especially. I'll read this in my own inimitable way. One night a man was crying, Allah, Allah. His lips grew sweet with the praising. Until a cynic said, So, I've heard you, I've heard you calling out. But have you ever gotten any answer, any response? Uh, the man had no answer for that. And he quit praying and fell into a confused sleep. In his dream, he saw the guide of souls in a thick green foliage. Why did you stop praising? Because I've never heard anything back. This longing you express is the return message. The grief you cry out from draws you towards union. Your pure sadness that wants help is the secret cup. Listen to the moan of a dog for its master. That whining is the connection. There are love dogs that no one knows the names of. Give your life to be one of them. It's not so easy to give your life. That's why, that's what practices are for. That's what the path is the path to. To being able to give ourselves completely to that love. That's what we all want. In order to give something, you also have to have it first. So we keep coming back again and again and again and coming back again and again until we're actually living here. And then we're in a position to give ourselves completely. Namaste. Ah. Uh -huh.
Vishnu Sadashiv Brahma Vishnu Sadashiv Hara 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 Mahadev Jaya Hara
Ha ha ha.